Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're having a great Dreamforce. And thanks for coming along to my session on adopting package-based development with org-dependent packaging. So I'm going to say package a lot, and that's going to get quite boring, but try and get over that. So I'm Keir Bowden. I'm the CTO of BrightGen. Um, I'm a Salesforce MVP Hall of Fame. Just getting used to saying that last bit. I'm certified technical architect. I've been working in the Salesforce ecosystem for 15 years, better known in the community as Bob Buzzard. Um, and I've used um, every flavor of first and second generation packaging in anger, so I've got a fairly good idea of where the benefits are of these. Um, so first off, let's talk a little bit about package-based development and why you'd want to do it. So the benefits of package, I don't know, was anyone here for Pablo's talk this morning on feature-based um, releases? Because um, one of the things he mentioned is you can't bundle metadata very easily, and packaging is a way where you kind of can. It brings in some additional complexity, but it is a way of isolating and bundling metadata from your happy suit, which is what I'll talk about. So the benefit of adopting package-based development is you get modular development. You can isolate your objects, codes, configuration, page layouts, workflows, flows, etc. You can isolate all that into a single logical container. Um, so you haven't got everybody working in the same big bucket of code and configuration and treading on each other's toes. Um, you get improved team processes. Teams can work independently and they can work at different rates rather than everyone contributing code into one big release bucket and you have to wait until everything's fixed and everything's perfect before you can release that. Everybody can do their own little thing. As soon as that's ready, that can be released. Version control is your source of truth so people aren't treading on each other's toes. People aren't changing the same metadata. Um, and what this gives you is a much improved release process. The main, thing, the main benefit I see is that packages can have their own release cadence. So if you've um, created a new application in its own org dependent package or in its own package, you can have your own cadence separate from everything else that's going on in that org. You can move along at your pace, which may be a lot faster, it may be a lot slower, but you're not being either pulled along or held back by what everybody else is doing. You're genuinely independent. Um, and because they're in packages, rather than having this, again, massive amount of metadata, it's very straightforward to automate deployments. You just install a package. You don't have to figure out how to build a package.xml with all the different metadata items and push that to production. So the problem with developing um, packages is, uh, for mature orgs particularly, is the happy soup. So, and that what we mean by the happy soup, you've seen, heard this term a lot, I would have thought, over the day, um, is basically your Salesforce org metadata. So it's all your objects and their associated page layouts, um, actions, buttons, uh, workflow, triggers, um, all the automation and code around it, all of that is in just in one big bucket. It's all in one big pile. There's no delineation between apps. You don't have apps that own their own objects and provide interfaces for accessing those objects. Everything just reaches in as it needs to, reuses bits of code. There's loads of tentacles going in different directions. Um, typically in a mature org, you'll have had many, many teams working on it over the years. And if it's been around for sort of 10, 15 years, then there really wasn't an awful lot of governance in place back in those days as well. The tooling wasn't great. Um, there was, wasn't a huge amount of advice about best practices. Typically, everybody just got in and someone bought Salesforce, company bought Salesforce, it went in, someone was told you own it, get in there and start building things on it. These are all the things that we need. Um, and this is hard to untangle. So the original Salesforce advice with second generation packaging was try and untangle all of your happy soup into a load of packages, into a base package and a load of packages that live on top. Because of the lack of app boundaries and delineation, um, you can't do that. You end up pulling in everything all the time. Um, and this predates um, Salesforce. So this wasn't said about Salesforce mature orgs. Um, but this, I love this quote. These systems show unmistakable signs of unregulated growth and repeated, sort of repeated expedient repair. I've worked in many orgs that, that have exhibit all those characteristics. So this is Brian Foote and Joseph Yoder in 1997 when they were presenting a paper on a pattern that they'd discover. So we call it happy soup. They called it the big ball of mud. Basically, it's really difficult to change. No one really knows how it works. Um, so the solution is kind of leave that big ball of mud alone, build on top of it using org dependent packages. So to give them their full name, they are also known as second generation. So these are second generation packages um, the, uh, the source of truth is version control. There isn't a packaging org like you used to get in first generation packaging. Um, it's aimed at team development, so everybody can have their own development environment rather than, again, one single packaging org that you all have to work in and tread on each other's toes. 
and you need to integrate with the CLI. The only way to create second generation packages is through the CLI. They are unlocked packages, which means that the code is visible and editable, and all the metadata is visible and editable in the, um, the org that you install that package into. They're upgradable, like most first generation packages, like first generation managed packages were. They're also downgradable. If you release a version, you think, oh, that's gone badly, you can actually revert back to the previous version. There's a few caveats around that, but generally speaking, that works quite well. And the key benefit of unlocked packages is you can move metadata into and out of the package. So you can say, initially, the package owns this metadata. Then as you start working with it, you think, actually, that would do better in the happy suit. Other things need to um, have that. So you can easily just effectively update that metadata to say, you don't live in the package anymore. You live in the happy suit. You live in my main org. And then the key thing is they are org dependent. The first line here is the beauty of org dependent packages. They are logically incomplete. Things they depend on don't exist in the package or don't have to exist in the package. So they can depend on the happy suit. They can build on top of it. And at, at package time, those dependencies don't matter. The assumption is they will be satisfied at install time. So that's when they get checked, only when you install the package. Obviously, they have to appear then. So essentially, you're building on top of the happy suit, not building something completely separate from it. So to talk about this in a little bit more detail, Standalone packages are every type of package aside from an org dependent package. So first generation and second generation, regular unlocked and um, managed. So the happy suit, the org, that button moves, that, sorry, that arrow moves to the right. So it refers to the package. When you install a package, you can start referring to the objects in that package, maybe some automation, maybe some page layouts. Um, and the, this exhibits characteristics that the test coverage is checked at create time, so you cannot create a package version, a standalone package version, without unit test coverage, 75% same as um, any other deployment. The package will install regardless of what state the happy soup is in, what metadata is there. It'll install into any org, essentially. Um, so the happy soup references the package metadata, but not the other way around. So the package is totally independent. And if you look at an app exchange package, that same package could be installed in several thousand orgs without any problems. When you get into org dependent, those dependency relationships go in two directions. The org depends on the package, package depends on the org. First point here is really important and is the one thing I dislike about org dependent packages. There is no test coverage checking at all. You do not need test coverage to create an org dependent package. You do not need test coverage to install it into production really don't like that, but that is the way it works. So be aware of that. It's on you to ensure that you have test coverage during your development. As I say, happy suit references package, package references happy suit. This means the package can only install in that happy suit metadata. You can't install it in any, um, in any Salesforce org like you could have packaged on the app exchange. If those dependencies aren't there, what you'll get is an error similar to that. So when you install the package, it will say, this is from my org dependent sample package. I've got um, an object called reading and a field called author. And it's basically saying that's a reference to an author, but that doesn't resolve. Um, I was able to build the package without that resolving, no problem. But what I wasn't able to do was install it. So I'm gonna, I've got a sample scenario to show this um, using a, a very simple happy soup. So not a complex uh, mature org at all, unfortunately. Um, that would take a while to go through. And I'm going to extend that with an org dependent package. So I've got a book source system. My as is, my existing system, I've got books, I've got authors, and I've got publishers. Those are all custom objects. And I've got a search page where I can put in some information that will show me all the matching books that I have in stock. The to be is I want to add author readings. I want authors to come and read their books at my bookstore and sell them. And I want to extend my search page such that it includes readings as well as all the other information it was capturing before. And also, because why wouldn't I? I've got a desire for modern package-based developments. I'm convinced by the first couple of slides. So this is my search page, my original and my to be. As you can see, the main difference is I've got this reading results. As you can also see, search criteria is identical. It'd be really nice if I didn't have to recreate that in my uh, new version of my page. Same as the search results, that's identical information. Again, be really helpful if I didn't have to rebuild all that in my package. And that's where all dependent packages is really cool. A um, couple of other bits of metadata. I've got a reading object which lives in the package that relies on the author and book objects that live in the happy soup. And I've got an Apex class which sets up some sample data and that relies 
on uh, an existing class in the Happy Soup that sets up some sample data but doesn't have reading information. So that's the sample application. So first thing I'll show you is the Happy Soup. Um, this is actually really dull. Uh, I will zoom in on that a bit. This is actually really dull because it's all logic incomplete. As you can see, I've got some Apex classes, I've got an application, I've got a couple of flexi pages, I've got some Lightning Web components, search criteria, search results, a few other helper things. I've got my objects, object book, author book, publisher. So all of that's my happy suit. It's not particularly complicated. It's not the kind of thing you'd go up against in a real um, org. However, that's what I've got there. Where it gets interesting is if we look at my package. And particularly if I start off, if I look at the application, bookstore with readings application. So you can see this has a number of tabs. It has author, book, publisher, book search, and reading. So if I go down to my tabs, I've got book search and I've got reading. I haven't got author, I haven't got book, and I haven't got publisher. But I can refer to those because those are in the happy suit when I'm developing against it. So that means that I can rely on that being there at installation time. Um, the same thing applies with my class that creates sample data. If I just pull that across a bit. So I have a method here. This is bookstore with readings sample data. It's got a create bookstore sample data. And then it refers to a class called bookstore sample data and executes the create bookstore sample data method. You'll note I do not have a class called bookstore sample data in there. So if I was to try to deploy this code through the Salesforce CLI into a vanilla org, it would fail because none of those things exist. Um, and I have to make sure they're there when I'm actually developing the package as well. But that kind of shows that you know, my, my package is very svelte and it only has the additional features that I need. If I need to rely on existing information in the happy soup, I just do that. The code refers to it. That'll be sorted out at installation time. So developing packages, it's not a silver bullet. It doesn't just make everything perfect and there's no impact on you. So you've got to go through a developer setup in order to be able to develop um, your package. So the first thing you have to do is create a sandbox from your production org, and you need to have um, source tracking enabled. Or if you've got really good control over your version control at the moment, you can do it through creating a scratch org and pushing the metadata for the happy soup. And you might choose to do that if you've got some standard metadata that gets installed into multiple orgs if you're running eight or 10 orgs. When you've done that, you must reset source tracking because that basically says everything's in sync. Otherwise, what you find is you do a pull later on, and a whole load of stuff that wasn't part of your development comes back and gets in your package and gives you a problem. Um, then you push the package code. So you're not deploying the package at this point in time, because you're developing it. So you've got your happy suit that was either existing there already, or you've pushed that. Then you push the package code on top. Then you do the development. Then you create the package. Um, so to put that in a slightly more visual um, mode, in the blue, we've got the Happy Soup repository. That goes in somewhere first into the Happy Soup metadata, either from production or via a scratch org. Then from the package repository, we push the package metadata. Note the Happy Soup repository has an arrow going in one direction because we push once and we do not change that. Whereas the package repository, that's what we're working on. That's what we're improving. So that goes in two directions. The reason we don't change the Happy Soup is that if you think, oh, while I'm here, I could just make a few tweaks to the Happy Soup, I can improve that. Those changes you make there, when you pull them back, they end up in your package repository. Then you get in this really weird situation where no one can understand how things you change in production keep getting broken at some point in time when you install the next version of your package. So always be really careful about that. So this is the development process, and this gives you an idea of where the time can go. So you create a package, simple CLI command. You then do some development on that package. You create your code, you create your metadata, and you create a beta package version. And you install that in a sandbox. Um, at that point in time, you can now start testing. So this is over and above the testing you've done while developing your package. This is testing the actual installation and what goes into that org, whether that all works. So is it all good? No, it never is. Never works first time, never works the first few times. So with that, you have to go back, do some more development of the package, then create another package version then install that new package version into the sandbox, then test it. So you've got this bigger cycle than you ordinarily would have. When you're happy with that, you can promote the package version, um, and that makes it installable into production. So then you install that into production, and then you test it. And then it almost certainly fails in some way. It shouldn't. The sandbox and production should be the same. They're never quite the same. There's different system integrations. There's always something different. So when that happens, you have to go all the way back to develop the package again. 
it's tempting to go and make changes because it's an unlocked package. You can make changes directly in production and you could fix that problem until you do the next version of the package, in which case you introduce that problem and you can't quite figure out how this happened again. So you've got quite a long process to go through each time, potentially, if you start hitting problems. And then once you're happy with it, then you're done. That package is then you know, properly released, ready for production, ready to go into other, pack other production orgs. So this is always, um, people always seem to like this slide the most, which is where I talk about what was hard and what went wrong and how they can avoid uh, going through that themselves. Um, you need to understand the CLI. You need to understand how to use the Salesforce CLI. There is no clicks way to create a second generation package. Um, there's, it, they're not particularly complicated commands in the main, so you can probably get, if you don't understand the CLI, you can probably get someone to write you a couple of scripts that do most of those things. Um, but I figure most people who are developers will be able to use the CLI. Plan sufficient time. This is the key. That whole develop, package, test, debug, go back to development. Um, that can take a while. And if you're like me, if you're a partner and you're recommending using all dependent packages to a customer with a mature legacy system, um, make sure they understand this and make sure they're all in on it. They will get benefits. They'll get better governance. They'll get better control. They'll get proper isolation. They'll effectively be able to manage features independently of each other. But it will take more time and they need to be cognizant of that. Um, a lot of the time customers say, yeah, that's great. And then they don't understand why all the budget's gone. It's not that it's any of those take an awful long time, just that you can find yourself end, ending up doing them 20 or 30 times in a particular relatively small cycle. And that does stack up, you know, a few minutes here, a few minutes there. You multiply that up over a number of days. Um, that, that really does, uh, does pick up. Um, the one thing I would say is develop the package and happy soup in isolation. It's really easy. All developers are very confident in their own abilities to identify what they changed and put it in the right place. And when, you know, generally speaking, the reality says that we actually forget. We get it wrong. We're not great at it. Um, it once you start changing, getting into the habit of starting changing the happy soup in your packaging development org or your package in your Salesforce production org or your Salesforce sandbox, um, what you'll end up finding is that you get these bugs that kind of keep, occur keep reoccurring and no one understands why. I'm sure we fixed that. How has this happened? We definitely fixed it. We've installed a new version of the packet. Where did it go? And it is because you fixed it in the wrong place and it got overwritten. Um, and it's amazing how long that can go on for, that kind of dueling metadata, especially if it's something which people don't do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, watch your package source like a hawk because things really will try and creep in that you don't want. So you need to have a really good idea of what metadata you're expecting to have in there. And when you see things that are new, when you're updating version control, don't just you know, blindly save them all and think that must be correct. Actually check them all and say, well, did I change this? Am I expecting this? Do I want it in there? Um, and when watching your package source, .force ignore file is your best friend because things like profiles will just keep coming back. There is no known way of stopping those things from creeping back into version control. So if you put those into force ignore, you'll never have to worry about them again. You've torn them up effectively. Pulls and pushes will ignore them. So that's a really good way. If you know you're never going to change that metadata, then you can just put it in there, and that means it's gone. You've torn it up. Um, so what next? If you find this interesting and you want to have a look at my demo repositories there, um, if you scan the QR code, that will take you to a post in the developer community. Um, which has got links to the, develop, the demo repositories, which are public now. It says they, they will be made public after the talk, but they're already public. Um, some good Trailhead modules and trails. Um, if you're really keen, it takes you down some of the ISV route as well, which gets you more into managed packages as well. Um, but that can be quite interesting. Uh, documentation and some useful community content that I found um, during my time developing these packages. Uh, before we wrap up, uh, Rad Women Code are looking for coaches. Um, so if you're interested in being a part of that, please grab those details um, and get in touch with them. I'm sure they'd be pleased to hear from you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming along.